Hey y'all, welcome back to another video. In this video, we're gonna take a look at creating a endless runner, endless racer, procedurally generated racetrack game. And in this video, we're gonna take a look at the track generation, but I'm also gonna do two other videos about resetting the floating origin. So as we get further from the origin, we can get floating point errors. And so what we wanna do is reset the player back to zero while kind of keeping the illusion that that hasn't happened. So we'll look at how to do that in the next video after this. And then we're also gonna do a video on just detecting when we need to spawn new track pieces. So we're gonna do three videos. I'm gonna to try to keep them as standalone as possible so you can get the information that you need from each video without having to watch the whole series. So in this one, we're gonna take a look at generating an endless procedural racetrack. Let's check it out. So what you can see here in the game view, let's actually turn off our star particles here. We've got this track made up of tiles, right? And as you can see, as we reach a certain point in the track, it generates a new pieces. I made the track kind of, and there you can see they expire after you leave them, like 30 seconds after you leave them, they expire, are deactivated. And so basically we're generating this track out of connected pieces, semi-randomly, right? But always making sure that we have a path forward. So I'm gonna show you guys this over multiple short videos. We're gonna look first at the level generation in this video, then we're gonna look at the floating origin, and then we're gonna look at triggering the, the track spawning and deactivating using events. So this is a video that's gonna be a little bit more beginner oriented than some of the stuff I do sometimes, but I think for intermediate users, there will be some, some good learnings as well. Let's take a look. Here, we have the level generator. So this is the thing that generates the level layout. We actually have a little cheat code in here where I can push T and we can generate pieces. And as you can see, right, it's adding new tiles, connecting them and moving off along the, the Z or Z axis. Now, in the actual game, those tiles are gonna expire and we're actually gonna re keep resetting the origin back. But one thing that's important to notice, we're always moving in this northerly direction, so, we never have to deal with the issue of maybe the track loops back around and crosses itself, which could be an issue in other games depending on what you're trying to do. But for an endless runner, having the player always kind of more or less trending in a north-ish direction is a way that you can avoid that. So let's take a look at this component here that's actually doing the generation. So we have, first of all, an array of level chunk data. Now these are scriptable objects which hold the key data that we need to spawn a piece. So we have the level block south to east in this case, and then we have an enum that records the entry direction and the exit direction. Now this is important for establishing connectivity as we spawn new pieces, right? And this is what we're gonna be checking against to make sure that we're allowed to spawn this piece. If we look at the code for this level chunk data script, it's a Really simple script, it inherits from scriptable object, right? And we have this create asset menu so that we can create it from the asset menu in the editor. Here we declare our public enum called direction, store north, east, south, and west as possibilities for that enum. And then we have a public vector two, which is just holding the size along the X and the Z axes, right? Now, when we look at this in code, it'll say chunk size dot Y, but we're actually using it for the Z or north to south direction. Then we have an array of game objects called level chunks. And what this is are the actual prefabs that we're gonna spawn with the level geometry in it. Then we store the entry direction and the exit direction so that we can make sure as we're generating track that the pieces are connected. So let's look at the actual generator that's doing this. If we look at the level generator component here, we have this list of level chunk data. We have a first chunk, right? That's the initial state for the generator. We have the spawn origin, which starts at zero. This will be modified later by our floating origin script when we're resetting the origin to stay close to zero, zero, zero in world space. Then we have the number of initial chunks to spawn, which is six. When we enter play mode, we start off by spawning six chunks, and then later we will spawn new ones 
as we go. So let's take a look at this. If we open this up in Visual Studio, we can see here are the fields, the public fields that we discussed. We also have a private level chunk data variable called previous chunk, right? This is because we wanna maintain knowledge of what the previous chunk that we spawned was and what its exit direction was so that we can spawn the new one that connects. Then we have the public spawn origin, right? Which is where we're gonna orient ourselves to spawn new pieces. The spawn position, which is where new pieces are actually gonna be spawned, right? And we're gonna make sure that that's offset correctly from the previous piece that we spawned and then an int for the number of chunks to spawn initially. Here, we're subscribing to two events. Now, these are the events that are gonna trigger when we've left a chunk and that's gonna tell us, okay, we've left one chunk, it's time to pick and spawn another. We'll look at that more in the third video of this series where we look at how we actually do that checkpoints to spawn new pieces. In update, we're just checking for a key press. This is just for debugging to spawn a new track piece using the key code T. We're calling the pick and spawn chunk function, which we'll look at in a second. In start here, we start by setting the previous chunk to equal the first chunk that we defined in the inspector, right? So we always have the same first track chunk. Then we use a for loop to spawn the number of initial chunks we want to have, right? So we're calling this pick and spawn chunk in this case six times because that's the value that we defined in the inspector. Underneath it, we have this pick next chunk function. Let's skip over that for a second and take a look at pick and spawn chunk, which actually in its first line calls that pick next chunk function. So what it's doing is we have a level chunk data variable called chunk to spawn, and we're setting that to equal the return value of pick next chunk. If you're a more of a beginner and you're not familiar with return values, basically, we can call a function and then tell it to return whatever it's calculated, right? So in this case, I'm saying, hey, find me the next chunk that I want, return it back, and then we're gonna use that in this function here. In this function, what we're doing is we're declaring a list, a collection of allowed chunks, right? So we're gonna build this list up. These are all the chunks that are allowed based on what direction we're trying to spawn in, and then we're gonna pick one randomly from that. The next chunk is gonna be empty to start, right? We declare a new level chunk data called next chunk that's equal to null, waiting to be filled by the code in this function. Then we declare a direction, which we're gonna to default to north, but is also gonna be overwritten by the next piece of code here, which is a switch. If you're a beginner and you're not familiar with what a switch is, it's basically a way to avoid having to use four different if statements or a long if else chain of if it's north, if it's east. We just say, these are all the cases. It could be north, east, south, or west. And we're gonna do something different based on each of those, right? And actually what we're gonna do is basically the same. It's just slightly different based on what direction we're trying to do it in. If the exit direction of the previous chunk was to the north, we know we have to have a new chunk that has an entrance from the south. So we're gonna say next required direction is equal to south. Then we're gonna set our spawn position to equal an offset to the north, right? So we're building a new vector three based on the previous chunk size. So it's gonna be, in this case, it's 1600. So it's gonna be 1600 units to the north. And so it's gonna cleanly line up with the previous chunk. And then basically we're gonna do the same thing for all of the other directions. If we exited to the east, we need to enter to the west, right? Once we've done that, we're gonna go over our level chunk data objects and we're gonna find all of them that match, that the entry direction matches the next required direction. Let's say we're going north in our hypothetical case. We need to find every level chunk data that has an entry direction to the south so that they're connected. We're gonna take all of those that do have an entry to the south and we're gonna add them to our allowed chunk list, right? So we're building up a list of everything that has a southern entry and then we're gonna pick one randomly. So we're gonna say, okay, now that we've added all those to allowed chunk list, then we're going to take a random one from that allowed chunk list, right? That smaller subset of everything that has a southern entrance in this hypothetical, and then we're going to pick a random one and return it, right? So now the return value of this function becomes 
this next chunk, this level chunk data scriptable object. Once we've done that, so we've said, okay, pick me a chunk that can connect. Then we're gonna say, okay, a new game, we're gonna declare a new game object called object from chunk. And that's going to be equal to chunk to spawn dot level chunks, right? So there could be multiple level chunks. In this case, I actually did one example for each direction, but probably in a real game, we would want multiple different track pieces that go from south to north, right? They all go south to north, but this one curves this way, this one curves that way, it has a ramp or whatever. So I left that in as a possibility for the future to say, okay, we have multiple level chunks, which are the game objects within this scriptable object and we're going to pick one of them and then we could say okay we've got a chunk we're going to set the previous chunk now to equal the chunk to spawn and then we're going to instantiate it right we're going to make a copy of it in the game world we're going to call it instantiate pass in object from chunk the game object that we picked we're going to set the position to spawn it to to the spawn position offset from the spawn origin right that's important so it's not just an absolute world space position it's relative to the spawn origin and then we're going to pass in quaternion.identity, which basically means just use the rotation stored in the prefab. After that, we have a function called update spawn origin. This is basically just taking in the updated floating world origin that we'll talk about in the next video. So if we jump back over to Unity, enter play mode, we can kind of see what's happening, right? So if we press T, our debug key T, we're spawning a new piece if we take a look at this one the, the origin here is 3200 0 6400 if we spawn a new one it's spawning at 3200 8000 right and it picked this was south to west so here it's got a south to a southern entrance a Western exit. So now when I press T again, we're gonna have to pick from either east to north, or actually the only one we can pick is east to north here, right? So pretty, pretty predetermined there, but basically we're gonna pick east to north. Now here, basically when we go north is when we actually have three choices, right? And of course we could make uh, some, some more options in here, um, but basically we can, spawn our track. As you can see, the spawning happens uh, pretty quickly. Right now we're getting outside of the um, camera's view for us to, we can zoom over there and then keep spawning, right? But so in this case, I'm actually instantiating. If you were really spawning a lot of stuff or these chunks were really complex, you could use a technique called object pooling uh, to optimize that a little bit, but in this case, uh, it's plenty fast enough just to instantiate. So that's everything that we need to do in order to spawn a chunk-based endless track, right? Relatively simple, but I think a pretty effective approach. So hopefully you guys found that useful and interesting. I've put a link to the entire project on GitHub. Everything is open source. You can download the whole thing and play with it. It's also preset with all the post-processing and the little day-night cycle script. And you can look at the particles and anything else that you want to check out in there. In the next video, we're going to look at how to do the floating origin. And then in the third video, we're going to look at triggering the track spawning. I'll put these all into a playlist when they're all released. As always, if you're enjoying the content on the channel, I would ask you to consider subscribing and if you do please don't forget to turn on notifications so you can actually be notified when new videos come out drop a like on the video that helps me get discovered inside the mysterious world of the youtube algorithm drop me a comment down below if you have any questions or any suggestions for other types of content that you'd like me to do on the channel i get a lot of interesting feedback from you guys and i always like to see it so as usual thanks so much for watching i really appreciate your spending a little bit of your time with me and i'll see you next time